Ryan, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Your your image is failing. Do you want to try logging on and logging back in to the to the call? Your internet. What? Might... Can you hear me? What? Are you having trouble? Wait hey. a minute. You're right here. We're here. We're here. We finally, oh my God, we survived the pandemic, or at least for now. <laughs> I may have just jinxed this. I don't know. I mean, maybe you did. Maybe you did. But uh, I like those odds. Mm -hmm. We're going to stare death in the face today just, and we're going to say, you're real. Not today. You're real too. Yeah, you're just... so real. <laughs> for those people who are only listening and not watching, we're sitting next to each other and, 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 and it's crazy because we haven't done that. In a long time. In a long time. We have not done this. It, what, we were debating it on the last podcast. It's, we were uh, trying to figure out what our last one was that we did together. Yeah. I want to say it was Thor Ragnarok, but that can't no, be right. Because Ant-Man and the Wasp was on Zencaster. So it's at least that far back, if not farther. <sighs> I think, I could be wrong, but I think like Iron Man 3 was our last one here. Oh my god. It's a long time, kids. It's a long, long time. But here we are. We we did it. We actually just came back from the movie theater of watching Shang-Chi. And oh my god. Just <laughs> So, first of all, so good. Welcome to Infinity Rewatch. That's uh, right, yeah. Oh my god. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Ryan J. Whitehead. And who am I? I think you're Andrew Fantasia. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> All right, we're, I love. I just have to say, your setup that Ryan. Every the reason this looks good, if you're watching, is because of Ryan. It's yeah. not because of me. Ryan has something called three point lighting, which I found out about 45 seconds ago. <laughs> he has a camera with a tripod and a microphone, which sounds pedestrian. It sounds like everybody should have that if they're if they're doing a basic thing. But to me, it's a big deal because I'm not as professional as Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a desk. I feel like we're Don Cherry and Ron McLean. Yes, uh, it's, yes. It's so perfect. Uh, if you're not Canadian, Don Cherry and Ron McLean are two old men who talk about hockey and wear fabulous suits. At least one of them does. Yeah. I wish we had their 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 wardrobe budget. But Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings just had. Oh man! Wow. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is our our first. Uh, our first time being in a theater for a Marvel movie together yes. yeah. since COVID. Mm -hmm. And our first time being in a Marvel movie together, uh, like in the same, watching the same film together since uh, Infinity, Infinity War. War. Yeah. So this is a big deal. This is a hell of a big deal, man. Um, and also, you got to understand in the Marvel Cinematic Journey uh, that we all are on as Marvel fans, if you're listening to this. And um, by the way, thank you for listening. Don't forget to smash that subscribe and leave comments. We love comments. We have some people leaving comments on the SoundCloud, which I love. So thank you guys for that. The angry ones are the best. The angry, Yeah, so angry. Um, so... Um, with that being said, we're on this Marvel journey, and Black Widow kicked off Phase 4 in terms of the movies. But as mentioned before, I still think this is an epilogue. Like, Black Widow is an epilogue. Um, Sanchi, definitely not an epilogue. No, 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 no. This one really kicks off into a whole new world. You know what? I will, I will half see your epilogue, and I will, I will say I think Spider-Man Far From Home was the epilogue and Black Widow was the was the prologue Ooh. to Phase Four. And, but then, as you're saying, yeah, Shang Chi uh, or Shang Chi, rather. Sorry, we have, yeah. we're gonna make sure we pronounce it right. Uh, he opened up the new world, as you're saying. <sighs> he just punched open those gates, and uh, which is interesting because gates is definitely the theme of this movie in, in in a way. And punching. And punching. And punching. Lots of punching. Um, but man, uh, you know, I think the best way to state the the emotional impact this movie has had is you guys have heard hilarious um, line drops uh, from my beautiful wife Isabella. She'll like, you know, a cl classic one is the Iron Man rant. Oh. Can't go wrong on that. At the end of the film, she looked to me and Fantasia and said, that was the best Marvel movie ever. Yeah. And that should tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so Feige, if you're listening, well done. Isabella approves. Yes. Well done. Well done, Feige, and also the creative team behind Shang Chi, the actors, the cast, uh, the crew. You guys. <laughs> yeah. This was a spectacle, dude. This was a spectacle. There's a lot of moving pieces to this movie, which I wasn't expecting. I thought it would just be kind of 
like a down, like, as you called it, like, you know, just a street level, cool little, little flick. And I was not expecting it to go to the places it did and to the lengths that it did with the places. Yeah. Like. Yeah. So it, it impressed. I, I was expecting to be impressed, but I didn't know I would be this impressed by just the production value of everything. I, I didn't think so either. You know, I, so first of all, guys, let's, let's just deep dive into this movie right away. Um, you know, for me, Shang Chi is a street level character uh, in the Marvel world, but yeah, he he does get into some epic battles for sure. Uh, you know, he was a part of the Spider Clone Wars. He's been a part of Avengers battles uh, of epic proportions, and so as a as a comic book fan going into this, I wasn't sure what kind of ground they were going to cover, and I I have a theory. But it's not confirmed. Um, so we're going to get into that. I have a theory, but it's not confirmed. Um, but we're, yeah, like I said, we're going to get into it. So uh, we get the street level hero. It's epic. It's fun. Uh, and it starts off in the streets, you know? Starts off with Shang-Chi having a regular old life. And not only did it feel like an not only did it not feel like an origin story, but it did a great job being an origin story and just kind of deep diving you into the world of Shang Chi. Like it, it spent very, it spent very little time building a um, overall origin story and just kind of like, okay, here's Shang Chi's world. This is how he started, and here, and like this is his everyday life. Like that's how it kind of just takes you into it. And it does a great job of not making it feel like the mundane origin story. It just kind of gives you the information you need in order to become the become the hero that he is. And so um, it kicks off in San Francisco, you know, and he's having his good times. Um, but what I liked is they really did a great job building out uh, the villain, who is the Mandarin, uh, Wen Wu. And it was cool to kind of hear his story as the opening. That was really cool. You know, you and your wife met uh, during a, a fighting, uh, I don't know, you, I think you guys were doing kickboxing or something? Muay Thai. Muay Thai. Um, all I kept thinking in the scene where Mandarin meets his future wife is, this is exactly how it went with Ryan and Isabella. <laughs> they were in a bamboo forest, turning and like slow-mo looking at each other. That's, it all, it was beat for beat. It was like Dustin Daniel Crichton mm -hmm. followed you guys around <laughs> and said, I'm going to film what these two kids did when they met because it, it worked. And here we are. It was, it worked so well. And the other side of this coin here is, is <laughs> it was beautiful. First of all, beautiful love story. Um... He's talking about his own love story. Yes, no, our love story is very is beautiful, beautiful and violent, but beautiful, but beautiful. <laughs> but okay, so we get the story of the Mandarin first, and we get the kind of backstory of the Ten Rings, which was really cool to see. And it, it, again, watching Wen Wu do his thing with the Ten Rings was just gorgeous. Mm. Like they did not hold back, man. They didn't even ease into what he does with those things with the Ten Rings. He did, they just literally he just goes nuts, and it starts with a very Game of Thrones esque. Uh, kind of war scene and it's epic it's super fun um and then he he's like conquering the world and he kind of feels like he's done it all and then he finds out about a mystical town now this is where the interesting part comes in because it's like the comic books like they make reference to what i feel like is leading to um a certain story but I feel like they MCU'd it a little bit. It's not exactly what you remember from the comics, but it definitely makes nod to something from the comics. So in so from this point on, guys, uh, although we did kind of spoil the beginning a little bit, super big spoilers ahead. Yeah, super big because again, if you're watching this, it's like you know, um, if you're watching if you're watching this, you won't kind of want to just join in on the fun with us. You probably have seen it at this point, but if you haven't. Spoilers ahead. We're going to get real gritty and real. The truth is going to be laid out here, guys. Can you imagine us trying to do this whole thing without spoiling a damn thing? I don't know how people it? review without spoilers. I, like I, Some of the ones I've watched are just maddening. Like, I would watch. I like watching a non spoiler review, mm -hmm. even though I've already seen it, just to see how they hide it. Yeah. And it's yeah. awful. Like, you see, like, some of these people talking about, like, The Force Awakens, and they're like, it has a lot of good stuff, and there is the Force, and Chewbacca does a thing, and I like. <laughs> and, well that's it right like it's i don't know how you do it anyways spoilers ahead you've been warned at this point it's your fault all right so um yeah so we, i i'm pretty sure they're teasing kunlun 
that that is the that is who we run into because when Wu he says he, he needs to find this kingdom and they get their martial art powers from the heavens and you know they can only access this place at a certain time so mm. all that is like uh hidden hidden kingdom plus heavenly powers plus you know you know only appearing once every few years equals iron fist and kun Lun. now is it kun Lun specifically it might not be because there were like eight different kingdoms um and it could have been one of them however uh when Wu, who he falls in love with she seems to have the power of the iron fist like you see it you don't necessarily see the glowing fist but the the big hits that she does that sends them flying i feel like it's very iron fist that's very interesting okay there there's a lot going on with this lady um mm -hmm. i wish i could remember her name uh she's shang chi's mother yeah uh first of all i like the idea of this being okay you said there's eight different kingdoms yes in, in kunlun or kunlun is one of eight kunlun is one of eight okay okay because when you mentioned when we got out of the theater you said i think that's kunlun and my first thought was like, oh, okay, that that's a good idea because we have this place and we have Kamartaj. Like, how many hidden mystical kingdoms are there, like, in the Far East, right? So I was like, are they going to go nuts with this? But if there's eight kingdoms, now that that just opens up even more world building. I really like that. Yeah. Um, and the thing with, with this mother character possibly having the Iron Fist power, I really like where this is going, buddy, because... She fights in this movie a couple times, but one crucial time, we don't see her fight. Her Chang Chi sees her fight. Yeah. But we, the audience, don't get to see what she does. We just get to see the aftermath, and it is brutal. There's bodies all over the floor. Uh, one of them is hers. Spoilers. But um, she she takes down a lot of people. So. I think you might be on to something here. Well, okay, so as they get through it, they talk about, you know, that she gets this heavenly power and she she's the protector of the gate, uh, which leads to her village. So again, this is another variable that literally adds to the story of the Iron Fist. Um, but do they flat out say any reference to the Iron Fist? No, they don't even mention Kun Lun. They mention that the town's called Tai Lo. Which I again I feel like that's like a uh, another way of saying Kunlun. Like it, it might be a comic book reference, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. It's just that's where my mind's going, and there's too many pieces of evidence that that's leading to it. It's very it's very similar to what we've seen in Loki. People, it's very similar to what we've seen in Loki, where they don't say it's the Enchantress, but everything surrounding that character seems to be the Enchantress. I'm not saying it's aliens. But it's, it's aliens. aliens, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. But that's See, we couldn't do that if we were online. No, we couldn't have synchronized the way we just did. Can't plan. You can't no. choreograph that. Um, so yeah, I think it was a huge, huge nod to mm -hmm. Iron Fist, um, and I think that's that potentially may be the closest we get. Ooh. Um, because and again, she gets her power from the dragon, and and she. The fight scene they have, which is a beautiful love story fight scene, which is very kind of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon kind of thing. Um, it's, you see her do, again, do certain movements and stuff that makes you go that, yeah, that's the Iron Fist. Right. And she's also, um, I, I love Marvel's costumes. So I'm always like zeroing in whenever I see new costumes in Marvel. Mm. When he meets her, she is wearing green and yellow. Yep. And then when we see the townspeople later in the movie, they are all either wearing yellow or red. And I know that one of the Iron Fist, whether it's Danny Rand or whoever, has an alternate costume, which instead of green and yellow is red and yellow. Yes. Right? So that adds up. That adds, adds up. adds up. Mephisto confirmed. Yes. He yeah. also wears red. <laughs> so, okay. So we get the, the intro story and we get the nod to the love story and everything. Um, the other side of it is, is then we get into Sang Chi's world uh, in San Francisco, which is really cool. Again, we're getting more West Coast uh, characters, which is really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, he's living his life and having the time, having the time of his life. And what happens is the the origin story is kind of the breaking of the axe through the movie. So you get the intro of the origin at the beginning of the movie, then you get like the the major conflict of the origin in the middle, and then you finally get all the pieces of the origin story at the end. Yes. And and then Sung Chi getting to where he needs to go 
is the transitions to each point of the origin story, which is really cleverly done. It's kind of like a Tarantino thing, I think. It is, yeah. They yeah. kept flashing back a lot, and I wasn't expecting that, but I like how they they waited for the right times to do it. You know, right. He sees his old punching post. We get another little bit of information. And I'm really happy. I was not expecting this, but I'm really happy with what you mentioned about his origin, Shang-Chi's origin, mm -hmm. where at the start of the movie, as soon as we meet him, he already has his powers. He knows that he, like, he's Shang-Chi. He is this fighting guy. He's not like a normal guy. And then all of a sudden, wow, I'm going to stare at my hands. I can do what? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm glad we didn't have to sit through that. Uh, not that that would have made me hate it, but it just, that's a step that I think we've moved past as a species now. <laughs> I think we have. I mean, we have evolved as fans from, from the from the year two thousand to like the year two thousand ten. I feel like every comic book movie had that one moment where the main hero looks at their hands. They're like, "I can do what now?" And I'm glad. Oh my we God. Did. Yeah. What? Like, oh wow! I can stick to things. I can fire things. And I was expecting that just because I've been conditioned to expect it. Yeah. But we don't need it. No. You don't need. No. You, you, Simu Liu is 100% on board with what his character's hands can do. He does not have to stare at his palms. But you know what's funny, though, is in the... So, first of all, you see this in the trailer is the bus fight scene. Which, oh, my God. Which the trailer not only shows you... I would say the trailer does show you quite a bit. But they, they show you literally a fraction of what actually happens in that scene. Mm. So, you see the San Francisco bus fight... You see the underground fight in Macau, Macau, Macau. Macau thank you. Um, and uh, and then you see the the battle in the in the, the Mystic Village. Um, but all three of those scenes you see in the trailer is like they they dial it up to eleven because you just don't get the full picture. Um, obviously done on purpose just to kind of hype you up for the movie. But man, whew, the bus fight scene is way more epic in the the movie. Then the trailer gives you like literally two shots of what actually happens. Um, and so, but my point is in that shot, and I'm getting to it, I'm getting to a point here, is that the fights, the fight scene on the bus is is him showing off that he's Shang-Chi, but it's Aquafina that's seeing him actualize as Shang-Chi as opposed to the hero himself actualizing into the hero, mm -hmm. which is the the, the the pattern that we've all seen. And it's like, okay, we get it. You got your powers now. You're starting to discover it. It's no, she is discovering that he is he has lied to her, this, her, their whole friendship. And now he's like this amazing fighter. And as, as someone who appreciates fight scenes, first of all, the fight scenes feel like a Jackie Chan movie. They really not only kind of pay homage to Jackie Chan fight scenes because of the the maneuverability of Jackie Chan kind of like the parkour element of it but the way it, it it's street fighting like it is it is very much very beautiful martial arts street fighting and it's gorgeous and some of the hits they do actually look like they land which makes it much more realistic I had to like you know flinch a couple times during some of those hits uh that bus scene by far my favorite scene in the movie by far in my like top three favorite marvel action scenes period right oh my god that plus so scene. good uh it's it's just a it's the kind of action scene i like it's a rube goldberg machine it's the kind of steven spielberg cause and effect action that you see where one thing leads to another leads to a third leads to a fourth that bus is out of control why not for no reason it's because razor fist you know stabbed into the floor because Shang-Chi dodged and he ends up cutting the brakes and then the bus is going because it has no brakes and the bus driver is freaking out and he hits his head. <laughs> it's one thing after another and that is exactly how good action set pieces should be. Uh, like this is just a textbook example. It's done right. And to top it off, you've got two characters that you're following, two protagonists, one of whom is, you know, not really good at fighting. So she's, you know, you, you feel better. You're like, I hope she doesn't get hurt. And there's these civilians, and it's all in a cramped space. Yeah. And these guys are dangerous. Razor Fist is like eight feet tall. That guy takes up way He's too a much. Monster. Space. I don't oh want to sit God. next to that man on any public transportation. No. Uh, so it is. It's just the the perfect fight scene. I, it, think it, I, I have nothing bad. To any say about that actually, I would even argue any fight scene in that movie is the perfect fight scene. They're just gorgeous to watch. Um, and that which takes us to the next big fight scene in the underground. 
uh, the, the the underground tournament fighting. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of get some interesting story fillings in there um, because, uh, first of all, I I still think and I agree they shouldn't they should not have showed the abomination in the trailer. No, they shouldn't have because the surprise in the movie would have been significant enough. But there is, and again, this is why I'm saying they kind of turn it up to 11 in, they turn it up to 11 in the movie because we kind of get a little bit more. It looks like Wong is training the Abomination. That's what it looks like. And that's why I wish they had kept this a secret too. Because mm -hmm. the fact that they were in that trailer told me these guys, you know, I didn't expect them to stick around for a long time, but it told me that these guys at least would stick around for a bit, even just for one scene to kind of move the story forward in a certain way. And they didn't. Yeah. They really did not need to be in that scene of the movie whatsoever. And we mm. really, I'm sure there is a plan. I'm sure there is a reason that we will find in the future. But from just from the movie Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings by itself, there is no good reason why Wong should be fighting Abomination in Macau. Zero. Like, he's got stuff. He's a busy wizard. He's got stuff to yeah. do. <laughs> Abomination is, as far as I know, a monster. And I don't mean that literally. I mean, like, the guy is a psychopath and should be in prison. Why is a good wizard hanging out with it? Like, there's there's no context for that. It's just there. It felt like a gratuitous cameo. And I'm sure it's going to make sense. But right now, I feel like if you had not shown me that in the trailer, then I would have just been like, okay, cool. It's a gratuitous cameo. Yeah. So... I think that was a, an odd choice to show that tip their hand like that. Yeah, I mean, but they did. They this movie does a great job of it, putting in a lot of characters. We did talk about this in the last podcast too. Is like, give me more characters to play with because I want to see that. And so they bring in his sister, um, and that fight scene's incredible. I mean, when she comes in, guys, does she doesn't waste any time? Like she just goes right into the fight, and it's just absolutely incredible. Um, and, uh, again, beautiful, and it, there's some origin story nods there, and it's, the movie paces itself really well, the fight scenes are just kind of like this, like, like, the movie's constantly building up a dance to a point where it's like, boom, okay, now big flashy moves, and that's like the fight scene. When the dance gets to the big flashy lifts and spins mm -hmm. and turns, that's when it's the fight scene, and then it goes back to this kind of, like, movement of the dance floor, and it's, it's a real fun pacing. Um, the fight, yeah, but the fight scene between the sister and the brother, really cool. Um, and she, uh, the women in this movie definitely get their due. Like they all are powerful characters, and they help move not only help move the story forward, but they they don't have any stereotypical tropes. They break down all those walls, and they do super badass things. Yeah. That, uh, the fact that she, like, I didn't know there would be a sister in the picture at all yeah. before the movie. So the fact that they, they made her this cool person who was just sort of like trying to start her own empire by running away from her dad mm -hmm. and doing, now she runs like the fight club of all fight clubs. Uh, so popular of a fight club that one of the sorcerers supreme is like there getting in the mix. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, as soon as you meet this lady, you're like, okay, she's cool. Like, we're, I'm on board for this. And even Aquafina even has a line where she's like, you're cool. I'm on board for you. Like, <laughs> so I, I, I thought it was a great little moment of, like, art reflecting us. Like, Aquafina's saying what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Aquafina kind of plays the character of, like, we're watching through her eyes kind of thing. Like, we just have that relationship. Is she from the comics, by the way? Katie? Her name no, is? I don't think so. I, I don't or at least I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. She could be one of the... Because, again, Sang chi not only has been a character throughout many years, but um, she could be in, like, the ultimate run. That, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't read that kind of stuff. So. She could be Mephisto. She could be. We don't know. We don't she, know. She wore red during one scene. She was a great character, though. And, again, she was supposed to be kind of the, com the comedic relief, silly, kind of uh, curly kind of character. Mm. But they give her a lot of purpose. And she does some really cool stuff. Um, and it, it, again, she's, she is funny. She has a lot of great moments. Um, so then, then the, the fight gets invaded by, uh, the 10 rings, a incredible fight scene there. Uh, then we also get the death dealer, uh, who, uh, a great role. And I think what I like about that is again, small Marvel villain. Um, but it's nice to see that character 
just play in this playground. Like, it's, throw more of them in there. We got two B-grade villains from Shang-Chi, Razor Fist, and Death Dealer, and they were fun. They were fun to watch. I will say this about Death Dealer. Um, I think he had my favorite costume in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. It just looked magnificent. However, I'm not happy with Death Dealer. Really? I feel what? I feel like they Captain phasma him. Captain they said, here's this really cool villain who's got a big history with our hero. And then... And then that's it. Hey, and then he's dead. Um... I, yeah, I was I was really hoping that by the time the credits closed and the lights went up, he would still be alive mm -hmm. because I felt like they were shortchanging him and that they were saving him for the future. And I'm like, great, save you know, pull a crossbones, save him for another movie. I love that. And then he died so quickly that I I was staring at the screen. I'm like, was that him? Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not crazy about what they did with Death Dealer. Yeah, I think he deserved better. No, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. I mean, Marvel seems to... Man, they, they're they going through the roster of villains. Mm -hmm. Like, and by that I mean, like, we actually have villains to add to the morgue now. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, they seem to just be tossing other villains, guys. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how else to say it. Like, which is a shame, because, again, you know, that would be a great mid-mini-boss in another movie. Totally. I mean, if... If I could only buy one Shang-Chi action figure, it would be Death Dealer. Just because of how cool he looked. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank God Razor Fist is still kicking. I'm so glad that guy kept... Every time he showed up, I'm like, please don't kill him. Please don't kill him. Please save him for a sequel. And they did! And I'm so happy now. Well, again, we don't know what the sequel is going to be. No. But I will... Okay, so going back to the film. So, again, um, this Mandarin is a very real mandarin yes he's got real problems and he's a real person actually whereas whereas in the comics he's pretty much just the head of the empire and he's very bad and he's a he's a big caricature in the comics too he's yeah very very broad strokes unfortunate caricature of an eastern character mm -hmm. here this was a dude who was like you said he's an everyday man but every time he comes on screen he exudes the power of this lord of a of a basically a cult i guess like a criminal cult yeah uh and he he's never even though he finds this balance where every time he's on screen he is always human and vulnerable and always terrifying yeah i don't know how they did yeah. it but yeah. tony leung his presence is insane like so so this is where the movie gets really interesting so we get to see we get to see Wen Wu uh, as the Mandarin, and they, we have this dinner scene after after the underground fight scene. We're taken like the characters are all taken to have a, a sit down with the Mandarin in his in his palace, and um, and they actually fix the entire Iron Man three villain explanation pretty quickly. Like they they did it with words, guys. Yeah. This is not like Rogue One where one scene changes like the entire movie. This was done at a kitchen table and they're like, see, here's what happened. Some evil dude took what I did, took my story out of proportion and created this character who's named after a dinner dish. <laughs> and it's just like, dude, he just, he just told it like it was. He, just, he literally told it like it was. You know, I'm gonna add like an, an addendum to this. Here in Canada, we have an amazing all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet restaurant called Mandarin. Yeah. And we have not been able to go because of COVID. Right. But while he was telling that story, they were also eating. And when I see characters in a movie eating, it makes me like want to eat what they're eating. Uh, so the whole... During that story, half of my brain was like, this is awesome. They're referencing Iron Man 3 and talking about how ridiculous Aldrich Killian was. And the other half of my brain was like, when can Mandarin open? Yeah. <laughs> But okay, so but they fix Iron Man three like within within a dinner scene they fix Iron Man three right out of the gate. And the beautiful thing is, I, I still think Marvel is like Kevin Feige and the Marvel writing team. I think they're still communicating to you, the fans. Like like that scene was pretty much like, look, we get we made a mistake, um, you know. And and in the end though, Marvel's like, by the way, names don't matter. It's the characters that matter. Mm -hmm. and 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 right after he finishes this entire story about this fake mandarin he's like people have called me many things like he just he jumps right into the note of like i am who you think i am but the name doesn't matter 
And and thus brings me back to my Iron Fist point of Kun Lun, because the name doesn't matter. It's it's what the content of that place brings to the world. Um, and so that was really cool. So then Mandarin's like, yo, you should come join me, son. Son, ain't about that life. And he's like, no, this is wrong. But they do do an interesting thing where uh, the mother is talking to him through the rings. Yes, or at least we think it's the mother. Yeah. Um, to me, it sounded an awful lot like Christine Everhart. Mm. But that's not here nor that. <laughs> Speaking of the Iron Fist thing, though, really quickly. Yeah. Did you notice what the name of the gang was that killed his mom? The Iron Gang. The Iron Gang. What's up with that? I don't know. I, you know, and again, I, I, oh, I, I am a little puzzled by it, to be honest with you. And it kind of, again, it kind of makes me go, okay, is it, are they like basing themselves on the Iron Fist? But like, yeah. but like, I don't know if it's just subliminal messaging of like, we're just going to name this gang the Iron Gang because, you know, you should, you should know that Iron Fist is in this movie, like, or like the Iron Fist lore is in this movie. And like, you have, not only that, you have Iron Fist, but then you have like Iron Man. Yeah. who is the face of MCU pretty much like they could have called this gang anything so i don't feel like this is by accident that they're called the iron gang right and, I, and this is again guys i'm curious to see what the the other comic book you know comic explain comic variant uh, variant comics all those guys like i'm curious to see what they're going to find in this movie that i just don't have enough marvel knowledge on they won't find more than us we're better we're better <laughs> um but at the same time uh yeah I, I i just really feel like it's like it's like it's iron fist guys yeah fans fans it's iron fist this is this, this is what you're gonna get enjoy enjoy because he literally could have just said your husband insulted my gang like yeah. they it, they could have made it straightforward like that but he specifically says the iron gang mm -hmm. um and you know i started thinking like okay shang chi is what five years old in that scene and I'm trying to do math in my head. I'm like, how old is he now? How old was he <laughs> when Tony Stark got kidnapped? Because yeah. like, would the Ten Rings, you know, would, would Shang-Chi be aware? Hey, my dad kidnapped this billionaire. Like what? I, I, and it made me do a lot of math just from him saying the Iron Gang. Uh, so I feel like that better mean something. Yeah, for don't, sure. Don't make me do math for nothing. Please. So. Uh, also, it's funny though. At this point, they actually do make another reference to the comics, a pretty fairly big one, which was in the very first Shang Chi comic. Um, Shang Chi invades the palace, and the guards are like, "Oh, we need to stop you and stuff." And he's like, "They, they." And then they have this moment like, "Wait, you know, uh, or no, you don't want to do that." Uh, Shang Chi says, "You don't want to do this," and they're like, "Oh, why?" And he's like, "Because you may notice something." And it shows this kind of face transition to him looking like the Mandarin. Ooh. And and he's like, because I am his son. And so why I'm referencing this comic, though, is in the comic, Sung chi was trained by the Mandarin. He was raised as an evil person. And uh, at one point, he, would, he, he even says in the comic, like, I would do anything for my dad. And... Uh, his dad tells him, gives him a knife and says, I'm going to send you to, I've kept you from the world, but now I'm going to send you into the world. You have to go and kill this old man. He's like, doctor, he's a random doctor, dude. Um, so he goes, okay. So he goes, and then he realizes that this is wrong and decides to go backpedal on that and then become saying, Chi, we all know and love. Um, and then they, they change the story of the origin story of Shang-Chi because that comic was kind of like, if you go back, it's, it's, it's dated. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, but that, but they actually use that scene where, where Mandarin sends Shang-Chi into the world with the knife to go kill somebody. That, that scene is, is directly from the comics, which was really cool. And that was a really nice knife. That was like you could have just put that on a mantelpiece, conversation piece for when somebody mm -hmm. comes over. No, go, go, go kill a person with yeah. this. Drax would keep that knife. Oh, Drax would totally keep that knife. This is a fine weapon. Is a... This will stab many Galactus. I will. Uh, I love this knife. I think I'll keep it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so great scene. And and then the sister also, this is a great way of, again, giving uh, the, the, uh, the ladies the ladies their due. Because she, she even mentioned, she's like, oh yeah, you know, I wasn't allowed to be trained. So I just watched everybody and learned how to become like the one of the best fighters. Mm -hmm. but again, a great nod to that. So the, so Mandarin says that, that he feels his wife is calling him 
and he has to go to the ancient village. Now, the cool thing is there's the pendants that Shang Chi and the sister wear. Those turn out to be dragon eyes that go into a statue. And then you see in the trailer where the water comes out of the wall and he explains. Uh, and then uh, they go to prison and we find Ben Kingsley's character alive and well. Trevor Slater, alive and well. He's been there this whole time just talking to himself in a dungeon. Um, yeah, he was, uh, he was a nice little welcome thing. I was not expecting him to be around as long as he was. See, that, yeah. that's... I was expecting his amount of involvement from Wong and Abomination. Yeah. Maybe even less than that from Wong and Abomination. Um, and I was expecting their level of cameo from him when he showed up. And it's like those wires got crossed. It, it does feel like that. He actually played such a very like a very significant role he was a pivotal part of the story super pivotal and and we get this weird fantasy creature he hangs out with and uh so the, and again so the whole point of this magic mystical village is that it's protected by a force that moves very cool concept mm -hmm. i absolutely loved it uh a force that moves and so the the mystical creature is like yo i'll lead you through it and you can we can go back to your mystical village by the way there's a little easter egg there do you remember the name of the play that he said he performed uh, that got him, you know, it, it saved his life, like Manor was going to kill him, but then he started saying a monologue from something, and it saved his life? I, I, yes, I remember the. it was a Shakespeare reference. It was. It was Macbeth. Oh. And in Macbeth, there is an allusion to a forest that moves. Oh my god, that's right! It's with the, um, isn't it with the, uh, not the witches, but they're like, um... Yeah, they're, they're, they're witches. As far as I know, I, I haven't yeah. met them personally. But yeah, they say, they tell Macbeth that the forest of um, Burnham Wood is going to come march on your castle. And he's like, well, that's silly. You know, trees can't move. But then it turns out it's like the enemy soldiers cover themselves with the, the leaves and trees and camouflage themselves. That's so cool. Great uh, reference. So yeah. That was that was a well played move. Whoever. Great reference. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah. So they get to the they get to go. <laughs> they, they, again, great action sequences to get there, um, but they get to go to the Mystic Village, and so we get there and we're introduced to the awesome Michelle Yeoh, uh, who just just pure grace. Oh my God, she is just a stunning grace of beauty and just powerful as ever. Um, I just watched Tomorrow Never Dies this morning. She looks the same. Yeah. I want to drink some of her vitamin water because she looks amazing. Yeah. And she could still, just from what we saw of her in this movie, I feel like Michelle Yeoh, not her character, but Michelle Yeoh herself could kick the ass of every character in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. And she, she kicks a lot of butt. Yeah. Uh, so... She talks about the story. Now, this is what we wanted to get to. This is where it gets interesting, everybody. Mm. Are you ready for this? Because I'm ready to tell you about it. So, she talks about a story about her village. And in the story of the village, there are these demons that come, take souls, to feed an evil ancient creature. Now, my flags were going up. I'm like, oh my god, Mephisto confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> no, were, were you really going in that way? I 100% was, because I'm like, it can't be Surtur, which Surtur would have made perfect sense, too, because Surtur sends fire demons yeah. to uh, to come in and steal souls in the whole nine yards. Um, but Mephisto, here's the other thing, though. Mephisto often gives you what you desire in exchange for life and you know souls and stuff. That is true, and that is what the thing was doing to yeah. Wenwu. Um, see, I th maybe this was too on the nose, but I was just like, it's got to be Fin Fang Foom, right? That's where my brain kept going. Um, it, but it's not, though. <laughs> fin Fang Foom, no. Because I, I know he's an alien from Kakarantara, and that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I was like, you know, well, I thought... Look at you, uh, flexing uh, that comic book knowledge. You're welcome. Um, but I figured, okay, they're changing his origin. Just, you know, they're changing a lot of origins. I, I'm down, I'm down, whatever. And she shows them, like, this... Uh, it looks like what Ego has got on his planet in Guardians 2. He's got those Marvel people. She's got that, but with wood. Yeah. And she's showing them, like, this was what happened to her village. And the thing in question looked an awful lot like Fin Fang Foom. It had the, the tusky horn things that he's got. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, ooh, they're going there. Oh, like, I can dig this. They're going there. And then when we saw the thing, it didn't look like him. So No, it didn't, it didn't look like him. Um, 
but that's and again this is where i go to the iron fist so the story goes the story goes evil comes out of this gate and starts taking people's souls and it feeds this like evil force and and the people had a hard time fending off the this evil presence and until a dragon comes and bestows a gift from the heart uh which that's what chow lao does uh but in the differences in iron fist uh the test is you have to defeat chow lao by hitting it in the heart and then you get the power of the iron fist so this time Chow Lao seems a bit more generous and is just like, here you go, everybody has it. You get the iron fist, you know. But um but yes, the dragon gives out the gift, and the gift is able to repel evil said force and then seals the evil force in the gate. Uh so we kind of get an image of said creature, and like you said, it kind of looked like Fing Fang Foom, but it's still debatable. And that, for me, I was like, okay, but it sounds a little bit like Mephisto, and it, it kind of does. But I don't know. And again, I, 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 I was kind of second guessing myself though. And so we get to that and then comes this like epic battle and it's awesome. You see it a little bit of it in the trailer. Um, but yeah, they take the dragons a power and then applies it to all their weapons, which was pretty interesting. Yeah. Very much like the magic we see in Doctor Strange where they, they don't get the magic directly. It's imbued in everything they do. In their artifacts. Yeah, the dragon scales were in everything. Um, and that's how they can defend themselves in the village. See, now, when, when we walked out of the theater, I brought this up to you guys, and, and I was alone in this, but I got the sense that the guardian dragon was either their mom or connected spiritually to their mom. And the reason that that was coming to me was because, A, he hears his mom, Shang-Chi hears his mom right before the dragon's like, hey, what's up, I'm here. And then, B... His mom and Michelle Yeoh, who are sisters, yeah. seem to possess a magic power that nobody else in the village possesses. Right. So I got the sense that whatever the dragon's mojo was is in the bloodline. So Shang-Chi also has it. And yeah. I'm assuming his sister too. So that's why I got the feeling, okay, maybe because that magic was in her blood when mom died she kind of became one with the dragon. I don't know. By the way, one with the dragon would be a great Bruce Lee title. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. So Mandarin figures out a way to finally get into the mystical town and uh, they, they, he goes towards the dark gate because he feels like if he opens it, he's going to get to see his wife again and life will be grand. Um, and again, you get to see him use his rings in the coolest way. Uh, it's just so gorgeous to watch. I'm going to buy nine other watches and just, just start <laughs> pulling them out uh, it's, it's awesome, and it's absolutely gorgeous. The fight scenes are amazing. Um, the battle is super gorgeous, and it gets into this, like... And this is where I say, like, if, if, if Lord of the Rings had a baby with Marvel, that's what this is. This is an epic quest. And it's it's just a high fantasy battle experience like one minute we're in the streets of you know san francisco and he's just doing some really cool kung fu and then we're just in this super high fantasy dragon battling experience and it's just like he's surfing a dragon at one point and you're like this is awesome and and here's the thing the cg does not look cheesy at all like it looks gorgeous it's it's kind of like those beautiful like ancient um it, like uh oriental paintings and it's just like just stunning and it's just moving and it, you're just uh, just out of awe with just the beauty of the whole thing and it's it, it becomes just such a fun movie out of that whole experience i i love the cg of all the animals to mm -hmm. all the animals in this world because there's like non-regular animals in this kingdom and they all there's look, phoenixes there's phoenixes there are lion bears uh, I think they're called. There's yeah. whatever the butt guy was. It's very Avatar. There's, yeah, it's very, it reminded <laughs> me a lot of Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they look like all the old Chinese statues that you would see mm -hmm. in ancient Chinese architecture. Um, I have to say, though, I thought Bad Dragon Man was kind of a mess. Like, we never got a great look at Bad Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, I, But, like, I still think that they managed to make mm -hmm. a fight between two giant CG dragons 
very coherent. I and, and again, this goes back to the kind of the Iron Fist lore is the the Steel Serpent, which is the evil Iron Fist guy, which nobody likes. Um, can't remember his name. Was you're, he in the show? Yeah, you're talking about him. What's his Bakudo? name? Bakudo. Bakudo. Oh God, that, yeah. that 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 was. He has the he has the the, the Steel Serpent in there as well, um, but uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Worst character Marvel ever did. Again, I feel like I feel like that's what that was because there's an evil dragon that you know you steal life force from people, so that makes sense to me. So I definitely feel the Iron Fist lore is very much embedded within Song Chi, um, and and yeah, and then the battle with the Ten Rings is just super fun, uh, and seeing Song Chi do all the Ten Ring stuff is just gore. It's it's a gorgeous gorgeous battle, and. You could feel the silence in the movie theater, just like just watching the spectacle that was this battle. Yes, that I'm. I'm so happy with the Ten Rings themselves. Yeah, because they are very um, multi-purpose. You know, you don't just use them one way. It's not like you know, Cap's shield, where it's like, yeah, he throws it and it comes back. The Ten Rings can do a lot. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you have somebody whose superpower is A, going to have to be CGI, and B, does a lot, I'm always worried that it's going to end up looking like Apocalypse's power from X-Men Apocalypse, where it's just like, here's a mess! <laughs> <laughs> and the Ten Rings didn't look like that. Yeah. Every time Wenwu and then Shang-Chi used the Ten Rings, it was coherent. We knew specific. what they were doing. It was very specific. Um, even though they were fast... We got the picture of, of like how they were using it and they were creative with it. You never really see them use it the same way twice. Yeah. I mean Mandarin uses it as a whip sometimes. Sometimes he's like like crushing a person with it. Sometimes he's floating with it. It's just a really great weapon to add to the Marvel Pantheon. And I just I wanna keep seeing it being used. Oh yeah. I, I love it. I yeah, I mean I love even the the the, the super jumping that he oh. does. Just that's a video game, man. Yeah, that's a video game that, for sure. Those rings stand next to Cap Shield and Mjolnir with me now. After, oh, after just one movie. Hundred uh, percent. A great, yeah. In the end, so it's a great story. And then the interesting. So I do think again, it's it's kind of the battle between a good Iron Fist Dragon versus bad Iron Fist Dragon, but it's all around Shang Chi and the whole thing. But I don't know, guys. You got. I would like to hear your feedback on that. I, I don't know if I'm way off the bandwagon here. But uh, that's the only, it seems to me like that's the best way they're going to do Iron Fist. And it makes sense to me. It's a very MCU kind of way of, of bringing in that part of the story and giving Shang-Chi, like being, Shang-Chi being the, the, the central character and the tour guide of like that side of Marvel, the mysticism. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just absolutely amazing and just uh, so super gorgeous to watch. Which brings us to the ending. <gasps> this is... I feel, I feel like we should we should not be just... it's pretty it's pretty amazing yeah. and uh, i actually agree with what the what people were saying is like the audience the ending left the audience stunned and the first end credit sequence definitely does that i can't remember a time i'm really trying to think here i can't remember a time when an mcu movie stunned me with both credit sequences i yes. don't think it's been done before yeah and this this we even said we even said it because usually when they do two end credit sequences one is like a, a an end credit sequence that's going to propel the story for like the mcu forward and the second one's a gimmick the second yeah. one's kind of like an offshoot hilarious thing um it's goose hawking up the cosmic no. cube or captain america saying patience you know it's yeah it's the silly thing it like even guardians with the second one the first one being the infinity stones or the no no what was the the first guardians was the thanos one i think was that i'll deal with them myself no that was age of ultron the first guardian scene i remember the second one was the oh, howard Dancing group Dancing Groot, yes, it was Dancing Groot, and then Howard the Duck. So it was both gimmicky. They were both silly, yeah. No, yeah, but uh, oh, Thor, Thor Dark World was the Infinity Stones, and then the, him coming back after. Then uh, there was the gimmick of like, what's her name? Um, Jane. Jane having just her being cereal. Jane having her cereal, being like, oh well, he did cross his dad, and he's like going to be banned, and it was just kind of like a haha -ha moment. Mm. But the first one was like game changer end credit sequence. It was epic. Undone, fight the goal. Uh, but this is the first time that 
like the both of the scenes floored me with what's gonna happen now um and i think um i'll defer to you ryan to start it off but i think i like the second scene even more than the first one Ooh. okay so um first of all the story wraps up very heartfelt very mm -hmm. uh, very kind of genuine disney heartfelt like it's just kind of like that emotion you feel um of letting things go and, and accepting things and the whole nine yards but you know what we should bring up we should bring up something that isabella brought up which is magnificent is that you say genuine disney but they also didn't fall into the trap that Disney likes to fall into, where they didn't shove a romance yeah. anywhere. There is no shoved romances. Nothing gets shoved Nothing. at all, except the bad guys by Shang-Chi's fist. The but. love story that Wenwu had with um, with the uh, with his wife with his wife was beautiful, and it was it was is just like it it was. It's kind of like poetry in motion. Like you're just you're kind of along for the ride, but it's not like shoved down your throat. It's and even the cheat like they they could have gone into some cheesy tropes that like oh it's two people at different odds with each other, but in the end they love each other. It was it was that, but it wasn't done in such an obvious blatant way where it's like oh she's gonna love him. It's like no she kind of she kind of dictate dictates it in her own in her own terms, which is really cool. Um, and so in this, the, the relationship between Katie, which is Aquafina, and Shang-Chi is they're really close friends. And and you they they do a great job of not stuffing it down your throat that it's like, oh, they could be together. Yeah. And that's and but so they and they have this scene, which is really well done the first time around, the second time around, um, where they have this dinner scene and they are explaining their lives and what happened to them. Um, and then Wong comes in and looks for Shang-Chi and he calls him out by name and he's like, I'm looking for Shang-Chi and he, you know, uh, teleports them back to, uh, Karmatash. That was a good wizard thing you just did with your hand. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, what do they called it? The, what are the rings called? Sling rings. Sling, sling rings. Ringed, yeah. yeah. Sling ringing them back to Karmatash. So they look at, they examine the 10 rings and it looks like now that Wong, it looks like Wong is working with the Avengers and they're kind of like now investigating all aspects of protecting their world from mystical threats, but now physical threats and just working together. Everyone's working together. It's like the United Nations now. Yeah, it really um, is. That's mysticism and hero heroism and all that stuff. Um, so he's, he's breaking it down. And so they're looking at the rings. We have Captain Marvel. And again, you know what? She's getting a little more comfortable in her skin a little bit. I'm noticing her character's a bit more grounded, even though she only had like three lines. Mm -hmm. And yet she's still doing the Superman thing where it's like there's a problem somewhere else. Gotta go. Wherever she's going, they better get to the center of that soon. Because I'm getting a little sick and tired of her being like, something's going on. I gotta go. I just, I'm gonna go. Bye. And it better be something cool and not just like... There's a bad Kree guy with a computer on a boring planet oh, yeah. of computers. It's got to be like Eternals level. Like, I, I hope she runs into Galactus. That better be like the Ooh, thing that she's yeah. like running into. Which brings me to my point. So, the first, so we see Wong looking at the thing and then, you know, Captain Marvel totally bails and says, oh yeah, Banner, you got my number. And then the funny joke is I, I actually don't. <laughs> um, and he, and he's like, anyways, we'll be in touch. Closes it. Um, Wong looks closer into the ring and he says there's a beacon. Now, we don't know who it belongs to because, you know, that's Marvel for you. They're like, well, here's, here's a tiny, the tiniest breadcrumb that you can now have fun speculating. Like, I swear, Kevin Feige and the, the writing team, even the writer for this movie was like, let's give them this and just see where they go. Like, it could... To them, it could mean nothing, and we could be providing the ammunition for them to be like, you know, that's a good idea. We'll imagine. Go. I know, but imagine? but that's it, man. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Like, they literally gave you nothing, and I, I'm curious to see what other channels have figured out. But he goes, there's a beacon. Now, in my humble opinion, the Ten Rings were made up of alien technology. So if it's a beacon, it's definitely reaching out to alien stuff. However, Captain Marvel's like, it's nothing I've never seen, which pretty much eliminates all of space. Mm -hmm. um which tells me it's an internal thing it's got to be it's got to be an internal level thing and the only internal i could think of that would make sense that it's a beacon with that kind of power is uh galactus that's he, the only thing i can think of I, is he an eternal or is he a deviant 
He's a actually he's a celestial. He's a celestial. So there's celestials, eternals, deviants. Okay, um, and I think eternals makes sense because Wong said, um, well, Shang Chi's like, oh, my dad found these over a thousand years ago, and Wong is like, they are way older than that, mm-hmm. and that's the only thing I can think of. Like the eternals are eternal. Yeah. So they've they're the only ones who have been around that long. Plus, they're the next movie. It all it all really feels like it's coming together, but. But that's too obvious. It is. <laughs> I I think I think there's more to it just because it feels ominous. Mm-hmm. The fact that it's a beacon, you know, if it was just a beacon to whatever, Scrolls or Cree. Or, or or even just like whatever the hell Angelina Jolie's name is. If it was a beacon to her, she could just show up and be like, No, it's okay, I'm a good guy. That's my my mm. impression of Angelina Jolie. I think her name's Athena. Athena, she, yeah. okay. So I think you're right. I think Galactus makes sense. Um, I don't know Galactus how... craves the power of the life of the planet. Yeah. And these ten rings are, like, very powerful. And, I mean, the, the rings were kind of, sort of, connected to that dark gate, maybe. And the thing behind the dark gate was a big thing that ate souls to get stronger. So it was very mm-hmm. Galactus esque. It it but also to be fair, they do talk about the Ten Rings and how they got them in the beginning of the movie. But to be fair, I didn't catch all the subtitles because I didn't realize they were talking in subtitles or like they were talking in Chinese at first. And at the same time, I'm too mesmerized by the visuals mm-hmm. and I, I missed a couple things. So there might have been reference to where the rings came from. But in the end, to me, I, just to kind of bring it back home here, it has to be Galactus. Like, it, it just makes sense to me. Um, the only other thing is the Kree uh, used to send sentries that would be a beacon for the Kree to come. I hope it's not that, though. I know, it's kind of, but like, that's the thing. Like, we've seen the Kree come to planet Earth in Captain Marvel, so that mm-hmm. kind of feels like a cop out. But Galactus makes sense because, again, this movie was about like the life life force and all that souls and stuff like that and it just makes sense to me that you know it would probably call on galactus i think that's the safest bet right now i think whatever it's calling is definitely bad mm-hmm. maybe maybe it's gore or not gore the whoever the villain of eternals is i forget his name he's got a name that sounds like it's really it's a really small name like og or or rog or Tor. something like that yeah. maybe it's calling him uh maybe that's why the but that, that feels like kind of like a yeah it does and i think it's more than that but that like that, that's literally the only thing other than galactus that i can think of so i hope it's i hope you're right i hope it is galactus <laughs> but uh, it's, it's funny too because the other the other interesting thing about this about this last little easter egg that we get is uh somebody was talking to Mark Ruffalo and he said he said as someone who's leading the next phase I don't want to ruin anything and which is funny because it's a spoiler in itself (laughs) yeah because we we get to see him and it looks like yes he's leading the uh, the the group now before we move on to the final post credit scene here let me ask you a question about Mark Ruffalo Uh, how long after the events of Endgame, do you think this takes place? Because he still has his cast. He still has his cast, but Captain Marvel has a full head of luscious blonde hair again. Is know. that just an oversight, or it takes time? It takes time to grow that kind of hair back. But she's also superhuman, so that could mm. that plays a variable in hair growth. It and, does, you know. So I'm gonna say half a year. Half a year? Half a year to a year. Have you ever... Like, wait, 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 wait. It was five years. There was a five-year gap? There was a five-year gap between the blip. So this has to take place five years after the events of Endgame. Not after the events of Endgame, just five years after... Or, or because his arm is broken because of his... his snap. Undo, yeah. So that was already after the five years. The five years is only really the beginning of Endgame. So I think... Once we reach the end of Endgame, and the credits roll in Endgame, I think you're right. I think it's like maybe half a year to a year. Yeah. To this, like real time, pretty much. Um, oh no, in real time, it's been over two years. Wow. Uh, 
Whoa. But does that does that read like? Do you have again? I don't know how bad the the time the Infinity Stones can hurt you, but can you be in a cast for two years and uh, be the Hulk? Like, is that a thing? Well, apparently, because it was emitting high, like beyond high levels of gamma, oh. and he was able to take the blow, and it broke. It broke his arm, and. It was also burnt too. Yeah. So I don't know. That's a tough. That's a tough one to dissect. But what 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 difference does it make? No difference. I was just curious because I saw the the cast and first I'm like, wait, what happened to the Hulk? And then I remember he snapped his fingers. But then I look over at at Carol and she's all like, in an Alberto V O five commercial. Her hair's so long. Yeah. So I'm like, wait a minute. And uh, but I think, um, you know, that when the movie starts after the prologue it says present day when shang chi's waking up so mm -hmm. i think it's uh i think it's just supposed to be now and maybe you're right maybe he just really hurt his hand a bunch for sure for sure yeah i think so too i don't know but it's interesting because like again it's mark ruffalo it's the hulk ruffalo. hulk's leading the charge here so that's he, mark ruffalo was signing uh, spoilers in ASL, so they literally put the cast on him to keep that from happening. I will say, if you blink, you probably will miss a lot of references in this movie. I feel like we did. I personally feel like this movie definitely takes a couple of walk arounds to, to catch everything. Mm -hmm. um, very thick movie, very dense. There's a lot of stuff in it. There's a lot. Like we were left pretty speechless after. Like it wasn't like, oh my god, blah 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 blah. It was. It was literally like it's funny because Isabella and Anna was there. She, she couldn't make it today. She apologized. Mona was there, and they were they were just like rifling off like how amazing it was right out of the gate. But we were we were actually left pretty astonished. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yeah. see what you did there. Yeah, we were left pretty astonished uh, on that one because it's just it's it it really did kick off the phase four, and it's it brings storytelling that like Ragnarok had. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like when we saw Ragnarok, we were like this is beyond anything we're familiar with. And Song Chi like even in Infinity War and Endgame, it's still very much central New York. It's it's very Avengers storytelling, but Shang Chi just brings so much different things. Like like we and for me, I I love the city stuff. But at the same time, it was like, it was like, okay, we get it. It happened in New York. I'm a little tired of New York. Let's get away from New York. Let's get away from realism. And that was the same thing with Thor. I thought Thor was tame until Ragnarok. Shang-Chi was not tame. Nothing tame about it. And it opened up more pockets of the universe, which I love. You know, it opened up the idea of, you know, what the Ten Rings are. It opened up the, the mystic village. Mm -hmm. um, and it, which uh, may or may not be Kunlun. Which may or may not be Kunlun. Uh, and then it also opened up this really cool sort of underground in Macau where people are fighting and Abomination is apparently friends with Wong and yeah. apparently they got Tim Roth back to just go a couple uh, times. Yeah. Just, dedication, that's dedication right there. Um, and, you know, it, I feel about that, those little pockets, the same way I felt in Falcon and Winter Soldier when they went to Madripoor. Yeah. So I love that. Give, me, give, me more. give us more. Give, me give more us more. That. More characters, more places. Now, speaking of giving us more, the final post credit scene at the end of it all. This is a big one. This is one of my favorite post credit scenes in Marvel. This is big. Um, the sister, whose name escapes me, it starts with an X. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I wish I could remember her name. She takes over. I just had an epiphany moment, but we'll talk about it. I like his epiphanies. They're always good. She takes over her father's criminal empire. Mm -hmm. And she parks herself Tony Montana-esque, Boba Fett-esque on the throne. And Razor Fist is there. God bless him. He's still kicking. He's coming back because he knows that's what I wanted to see. And the empire is continuing uh, a new uh, modern age for her father's empire. Ryan, I, I think I would almost bet money that this is going to be another Disney Plus show. Because the way they worded it was not Shang-Chi will return. They very blatantly threw the logo at us and said the Ten Rings will return. And that blew my mind. 
I agree. It was very mind blowing indeed. Um, I actually think not only is it the Ten Rings will return, the Ten Rings are returning as the hand. What? You think they're going to be the hand? I absolutely think they're going to be the hand. And I'll tell you why. Because this whole thing, if the Iron Fist thing plays out and it's true, um, think about it. Because the whole thing was, it's about the Ten Rings and stuff. But the other side of that coin was the Iron Fist. And the whole thing about that was about the hand, right? So the other thing I noticed is they're all wearing red. Like she's wearing red. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, like, female ninjas and stuff like that. And the village they came from, they all wore red outfits. Yeah. Which, to me, brings us full circle into the hand. Does the hand wear red primarily? Yes. Wow. Okay. And and so, and I think that um, uh, Sangchi's sister, uh, uh, Zha Ling, uh, she becomes the lady, she becomes, like, the lady Mandarin, which, in, I think, in the Ultimate Comics that that was a character um but i honestly i think that they're kind of doing again i think mcu is still kind of trying to play around with the idea of mixing villains kind of together or mixing lores together and i think we're getting the hand do you know why that excites me because we're getting daredevil and because we're gonna get electra <laughs> Because where there's Daredevil, there's usually... Kingpin. Yeah, there we go. With Vincent D'Onofrio. Which means, because apparently Disney Plus, we may get Kingpin. Maybe, yeah. And the other side of this is uh, Hawkeye did some stuff in the East, the Far East. He did go to Japan. He did. However, um, yeah, I think I think the hand makes sense because... The hand also deals with very mystical level stuff. And if phase four is kind of getting into that level of mysticism, mm -hmm. the hand would be a perfect kind of Hydra level faction. Cause it's, cause if you think about it, we had aim. Yeah. We had a little bit of aim, a little tiny bit of aim. We had a lot of bit of Hydra. Yeah. Uh, so we need a Hydra esque faction that will fulfill part of phase, uh, phase four. And it just makes sense to me, the perfect counterpart to Carmitage with all like the Sorcerer Supremes and stuff like that. It just makes sense to me to have a ninja group that would be familiar with mysticism. My money's on it's the hand. I really like this, man. I really like that train of thought. And also, where you get the hand and these sort of th this big uh, ninja conglomerate in Japan, you also get a nice little uh, pocket of origin story of a certain Canadian mutant who hangs out in Japan with ninjas a bunch. Good old Logan, baby. <sighs> this is a great place to be. This is epiphany. Yeah. This is this uh, is a pure epiphany moment. I really think that we're going to get the hand. I'm Because she's wearing red. Like, she's wearing... A really kind of red and I feel like some of the characters were wearing red as well and the graffiti and stuff is interesting because you see a lotus in the middle of the ten rings with a skull mm. um, I don't know what that means yet I haven't done enough research but to me the the whole point of the hand was each finger represents one of the kingdoms mystical kingdoms mm. so I'm curious to see if that's what's gonna play out and and again with the hand was all about the Iron Fist stuff, so it to me it's it's adding up. To it's really adding up. And you know what? Put yourself in her shoes for a second. Put yourself in Shelling's shoes. She hated her father. Yeah. Her father walked around for almost her whole life with these stupid rings that she hates because they yeah. they represent everything awful about what her father became. Yep. And they came into the picture as soon as her mom died. She hates those damn things. I I don't think she's mad at all that Shang Chi took all ten rings with him. Yeah. Imagine she takes her father's empire, which is named after these weapons, and she says, you know what? I don't need ten rings to do what he did. I have my hands. I love it. That's, that's cinematic storytelling. And I, I think it's perfect, because again, like Marvel's, to be fair, guys, like we're still in, we're in uncharted waters at this point. Nothing is as familiar as it used to be. Like, 
like when we looked at Iron Man, you know, when we looked at phase one or phase two, we could easily go, okay, Ultron's from this, this is going to be this. And like, you kind of had some familiar ground to work on. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're getting as much as that. And, and they're not spelling it out for you either. Like they're really making you connect the dots. So I think we made some really good work here and I think we're onto something. And I'm very curious to see if anyone else is on the same page. I think so too. I really like this. I, now, all right. So it's it's still early. You know, we've only just seen it. But do you think you have a, a rating out of zero stones? A gauntlet. To, Hands. <laughs> God. Go right to the gauntlet already. Right to wow. the gauntlet. I had to. I have to write I, that down. I had to, my friend. Have you ever seen my my uh, how never, I no, my I notes? I, I this is how I keep. Looks it like a new phone, actually. It's a, uh, an old phone, but thank you. I try to take nice care of it. But see, mm. I have I have a thing for every every movie. And I put the poster, and I do it for the shows, too. Uh, so let me see. There's Shang-Chi. Oh, my there. God. Uh, yes. And I don't have any notes written because writing notes in the theater would have been rude. Rude. And I didn't do that. But uh, Don't well, use your phone during a movie theater. Yes, please don't. Um, don't be a texting Tommy. Texting Tommy. Uh, all right. So Ryan is going Infinity Gauntlet. I have to. And I tell you why. I, I got to give props to Isabella. Because, like, I remember when Doctor Strange happened, and I looked at her, and I was like, was that not the best Marvel? Or no, it was Civil War. I looked at her after Civil War, and I'm like, was that not the best Marvel movie ever? And she's like, really? Like, she had that moment of, like, really? She turned to me and said it was the best Marvel movie ever. So I have to give her props to that. But as someone who enjoys martial art movies and everything, that was a martial art movie. Like, that was beautiful. It was. It was a delight hearing you take delight in the martial arts. And... Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Okay. So I got you down for Infinity Gauntlet. Beautiful. Also, side note, I love that they brought in the guy from Spider-Man. And he's, <laughs> oh, he's filming and he's doing that. Oh, so good. I love that um, the annoying vlogger has become such a trope now. Yeah. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy. I'm vlogging. Um, I am going to go for now. It's early. It's this really might change, really. but I'm going to go five Infinity Stones. I am. Ooh. I think I think there's uh, I think there's a couple just a couple little things that I would have liked to see differently. Um, Death Dealer being one of them, and um, I think I would. And this is just a a selfish thing for me, but I I, I wish I got to spend more time with Shang Chi himself. Um, mm -hmm. because I feel like this... Quite the ensemble. Yeah, and it's an ensemble movie from minute one. Uh, you meet Wenwu and his wife before you meet Shang-Chi. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're big characters. So I, I wish I got to spend just a bit more... I wish there was sort of like, I don't know, 10 minutes extra in the movie where he's on his own and we're just with him. And I don't know why I feel that way, but I just feel like if we had that, we would get more of an insight into who this guy is and how he feels so that when he walks into that final fight and he says, you know, I might have to kill my dad here, uh, it, we're sort of along. Our relationship with him is that much closer to what Aquafina's was with him. Yeah. Because I feel like if we were as, as tight with him as she was, that would have been a bigger moment. Uh, so I, I think it's just little, little weird things like that that make me want to uh, and, and, and the whole thing with the cameo and, and Trevor and the abomination and all that. So right now it's five stones, but that might change. That might change. It's early days. It is early days. Who are we? Oh, and I should also mention, uh, I think I told you this last time, Ryan, but I want to mention it now because it's relevant, is we, uh, we had a whole episode that you can listen to or watch on the Rebel Scum Podcast Detours called the Runtime Rundown. Yes. Where we guessed what we thought the runtime was going to be for all the upcoming Marvel movies. And when it comes to Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings... Um, Ryan was very, very close. He was much closer than I was. I guess 203, he guessed 210, and I think the final tally is 213. No! So, three he, minutes. He is up by three minutes. But that, that means I win, right? Because I'm the closest. Yeah, you're the closest. Yeah. You definitely win. Uh, I'm going to put a little... One point! I'm going to put a little uh, tick next to you there to say that you got a point. Oh, let me put an X or something. Um, Turtles is going to be epically long. I have, a I have a big feeling that Turtles is going to be pretty epic. I hope No Way Home is long as hell. They're, they're, apparently they're masking the screen time. They, they said the screen time's X, but it's, it can't be. It's too short. It's going to be a long movie. Yeah, I hope that thing just doesn't stop. Um, all right, so who are we adding to the Marvel Encyclopedia of Characters from oh the comics? Oh, my on God. A, Where is my SH? 
because I might as well start with the man himself. Here we go. Shang-Chi. There Sa we go. Shang-Chi. Um, and then we got... Uh, oh man, I keep forgetting. Uh, we got Wen Wu, the Mandarin. Yes. Let me get him here. Ooh, wow. The M's are high up. There we go. I'm going to put Mandarin slash Wen Wu. And then, okay, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get... I'm pretty sure the mother is an actual character. I'm 100% I'm sure. Because I think she is the female Iron Fist. I'm pretty sure. Right. Uh, um, la, 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 la. While you search that, I'm going to put Razor Fist. Yes. Who really should be... Uh, he should have a road trip movie with Taser Face. <laughs> Razor Fist. His, his car, by the way, is absolutely hilarious. His, his car reminds me of the uh, the mm. pussy wagon from Kill Bill. <laughs> uh, Lee is her name. Lee. Yeah, Just L-E-E? -E? No, L-I. L-I, thank you. All right, Lee. Okay. And we also have Death Dealer. Yeah, we also have For Death. a bit. For a bit. Death Dealer is there. And who else did we meet? Uh, we got Razor Fist. Oh, the sister. Sister. Um, Shi Xiaoling. Yes. And y Ying Nan, I think, which is Michelle Yeoh's character. Oh, yes. Yeah, she's important. She's important. Again, I don't know if she's... Again, I don't know most of these characters if they're Marvel characters. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually looking up... Because there's a guy in the town uh, that they really seem to point out something interesting. Uh, um, Which guy are you talking about? The pie male looking guy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mandarin... Uh, Mandarin says to him, Don't talk down to me, young man. I love and, that line. And too. he calls him out for it. Uh, and so in Iron Fist in the village, there's a guy called Thunderhead. And he trains uh, Iron Fist. And so it feels to me like that's that's him. But again, there's they give you very little. And they don't say what his name... They don't say what his name is. Hmm. Yeah, I guess for now we'll leave him off. Um, mm -hmm. We can correct it in the next episode yeah. if we miss anything, and you guys will just have to check in on us on and see if we figure it out. But I'm pretty sure his name's Thunderhead. Um, I'm yeah, we'll see. Because they mentioned his name quite a bit. They say his name a few times in the film. Yeah. Oh wow, I missed that. I missed them saying this. Is, is his name's like uh, Gung Hao, Gung Hao, or something like that? He was very good with arrows. Yes. He's a great arrow master. Um, now it's time to bury some folks in the cemetery. Yep, Death Dealer. Oh boy, Death Dealer. This makes me sad that I have to put his name on this list so soon. All right, Death Dealer. Um, well, I already know what I'm writing on his tombstone. All right, rest in peace, Death Dealer. We hardly knew ye. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, That's it. And then there's Mandarin Wenwu is going in there too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Already. That's a shame already. But you know what? I guess there's no real other way for him to redeem himself than to go out. Um, which we didn't even really mention during our, our, our sort of recap here. But he sacrifices himself to save his son. Yes. From the, monster, from the soul way. sucker monster. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was really... I love how he he's looking at, at his boy. Yeah. He died. He's not turning around to face this thing. He's just... He's looking at his boy. Uh, that's beautiful. The humanity of Wenwu was just off the charts. Oh, you feel every, like you feel all the feels. It makes me really glad that John Favreau held out on Mandarin. It, it's it makes sense. You can't. Yeah. He's such a complex character, even in the comics. And they do they again like like you said it before. He's a very um, I can't remember the word you use. He's, he's very, broad. He's, he's a very broad stroke. stroke character. Yeah. But there's still a lot of layers to him in terms of, of his of, of his uh, humanity as a character. And so, yeah, it, it really begs the question a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I'm definitely glad they waited and they gave the right casting. And, and man, Tony gave a lot of gravity to that character. He was very scary. He is worth the wait. Yes. We, you know, we sat through three Iron Man movies and every time we were like, maybe this one will be the one where Mandarin shows up and he didn't. But he was worth the wait. 100%. Well, that's it for Shang-Chi, guys. I'm so glad to finally be back know, here and back doing, doing this Infinity Rewatch in person. 
<sighs> and we got a long way to go, man. We got, uh, we have, we have Eternals coming up. We have potentially Miss Marvel. Uh, we have, um, give me a second. I'll get there. Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and then we also have Spider-Man So we to, to wrap up the year. So we have still quite a schedule ahead of us. We do. I feel like every second of my life right now is taking me one second closer to Spider-Man No Way Home. I like know. it's just that's yeah oh boy if, I, if kingpin shows up in that movie with his white suit and daredevil i'm gonna run laps around the movie theater that that's all there is to it we all want d'onofrio we want you d'onofrio we want you back yeah we miss you we want that that just that presence you bring and and it's again marvel needs its villains and yes please and yes we may have got a pretty badass one at the end with uh Jialing, but but to be fair, like again, Marvel needs villains and they don't have that many reoccurring. Mm -hmm. And Kingpin would be perfect. Yes, please make him a reoccurring villain. Oh my God, please do that. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be quite a year. It's going to be quite... 2021 is almost over. There are four months left. But boy, howdy, do we ever have a lot of stuff to cover. We got a lot. And we still got to finish What If. Oh, we... yeah, What If. I was just going to say that. We, we, what If is not even done. Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey Wright is still asking us that question. He hasn't put a cap on it yet. That's right. That's right. Well, Ryan, it has been... I am so happy I could come here with your giant, beautiful table and your lights, your three-point lighting, which I know now exists, and a camera, and just be back in the room in this condo. I have not been in your condo since before the world turned upside down two years two years and here we are seeing a marvel movie in a movie theater oh my god we did it we did it we did it and shang chi did it simu liu we love you buddy you're from toronto you rock this keep up the great work and we love everybody who listened as well um and if you want to listen to ryan talk about other things you can do so at twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. You can check me out on Twitter at Crusader Online. And you can check me out on Instagram at Ryan J. Whitehead. And I guess if you want to follow me, you can do it on Instagram at Andrew Fantasia. And on my Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel, uh, I've got a big thing brewing there right now as we count down to Bond 25 starting September 14th. You can listen to me do a retrospective, video retrospective of every James Bond movie, one per day until No Time to Die comes out on October 8th. And I'm very excited. Uh, and that's going on there right now. And you can hear me here on the RebelScom Podcast Network and on Affinity Rewatch, because as we just said, there's a lot to rewatch and just watch for the first time. Yeah. As well. We're watching. We're, we're just Infinity Watching at this point. Yeah. Uh, it's an Infinity Watch party. Until we see you again, until you hear us again, until I see you again, my friend, have a marvelous day. Hey scumbags, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.